But the problem is, like you're saying, the concentration of where people are buying is often leading to market uh, making behavior, price making behavior. So I think that's a phenomenon that's contributing towards a lot of these buyers agents becoming market maker shapers and and also just how lucrative the industry is welcome to get invested on the property hub podcast channel the leading weekly show for australians who want to learn how to unlock their full self health and wealth potential i'm your host bushy martin and each week i go deep with the best investors experts leaders and founders to find out what it takes to break free from the grind discover freedom and to live by design Subscribe now and join me and get invested in the life that you really want. Let's get started. Hi, friend and followers. Welcome back to part two of my great conversation with PK Gupta. Today, we dive into the details of what I call property market makers and movers and what you need to be doing to avoid the mistakes of the growing order of FOMO-driven momentum investors that are competing with each other to buy subpar properties in short-term artificial hotspots that are being fueled by the instant expert, high-profile buyer's agent, Property Pipe Pipers, so that you're better prepared to protect yourself and you learn what you need to be doing where and how to ensure you're securing long-term outperforming properties that will fuel your version of freedom. So listen up for the wealth of impartial wisdom that you're going to learn as we get invested again the one and only PK Gupta. Let's now jump into the the subjects that I'm very keen to uh, get your views on, and, and let's go back to the old buyer's agent market maker concerns. Because following on from the the thoughts I expressed in the intro about high profile buyer's agents who are self proclaimed experts mostly, and then creating short term self fulfilling prophecies and becoming market makers by shoehorning herds of unsuspecting investors into competing with each other to buy what I consider to be low quality, overpriced and underperforming properties. What what are your observations and thoughts around that? Yeah, look, it's a tough one because I have to preface by saying I don't have hard data to be able to prove anything because it's so difficult to like isolate buyer's agent transactions and behavior and say these are the properties that, you know, did this and these are the properties that did that and they weren't by by buyer's agents so these are hypotheses and i think i'm throwing it out there as well to you bushy and and seeing genuinely and none of this is prepared right so genuinely what what you think about my inferences i think i want to also be balanced and and not be negative unnecessarily towards buyer's agents in in what i'm saying yeah so the the first thing is that i feel that it's a good thing that people have more free education online, right? As you said in the intro before, these days on podcasts, YouTube, uh, Facebook groups, so many things, right? You have a a lot of free education. I think that really helps people uh, avoid making obvious mistakes. So I think perhaps maybe 10 years ago where, and these are made up numbers, 30% of investors would have bought a house and land package because they clicked an ad or that's what their broker recommended. One of their friends who is a developer, you know, gets kickbacks or whatever, buy a house and land package off the planet apartment. Now these folks are like, you're talking to their wife or husband or whatever and like saying, oh, look, honey, let's, uh, let's just check out this Facebook group or let's just check out this podcast by this guy called Bushy or let's just check out this YouTube channel by this guy called PK and use some keywords and see if we're doing something wrong. And then all of a sudden, a lot of these folks are, are saved. Um, and, and maybe that's not the perfect analogy because you and I aren't buyer's agents. But let's say a buyer's agent has good free content. Yep. And so now they've not bought house or land package somewhere where it wouldn't have grown. Or they haven't bought in a really poor location. Instead of they've bought, you know, interstate, you know, something that's high yield, all the good things that we've been talking about. But the problem is, like you are saying, the concentration of where people are buying is often leading to market uh, making behavior, price making behavior. But m- my question to myself is, what's worse? Uh, these people have been diverted from making terrible mistakes and and uh, buying on the whim of those folks. We see their Facebook ads, YouTube ads, 
uh, where they're selling, you know, all, all, I won't go into it, but not the best property depreciation benefits and rental guarantees and this and that. At least they're saved from that and they're going right. into something a little bit better. So I think that there's that phenomenon, right? Where, you know, a lot of these suburbs and pockets, let's say in Perth, let's say Armadale, have, are being pumped because folks have otherwise would have bought in Wallen in in north of Melbourne, which is probably not the best idea because you're not going to register that, that land for two years. Yeah. The build will be delayed for three years, costs will blow out, and you'll have uh, regretted clicking that Facebook ad. So th I think that's that's one phenomenon. The other phenomenon I think you alluded to before is I think a lot of people now are becoming property investors because of a lot of advertising online. Everyone's on their phone, like I myself um, I'm on my phone a lot because of my business and, you know, it's like a vortex and you just end up doom scrolling and you just have to slap yourself after it, out of it after five or 10 minutes or, or longer, right? And then they find out about property investing because of their magic algorithms and then, you know, six months later, they end up buying a property. So I think there's more property investors now and the, and the stats actually show this versus five years ago. Uh, so I think that's a phenomenon that's contributing towards a lot of these buyers agents becoming market maker shapers and and also just how lucrative the industry is. I mean, you know them, I know them, and look, everyone's got to pay their bills, so I'm not uh, attacking them from a personal perspective, but you become a buyer's agent today, in, in a year, 18 months, all of a sudden you're getting... 30 clients, <laughs> right? 30 clients a month. And it's like your wildest hopes and dreams have been fulfilled. You've bought a holiday home. You've got a couple of nice Italian sports cars. And, you know, now you've got to maintain this thing. It's that fix. It's that greed. A little bit opposite to, to what you're saying for yourself, Bushy, where you're like, I don't have to do this. Like, I don't, you're not really doing it for the monetary um, outcome alone, but a lot of these folks, because it's new money, it's not old money for them, it's new money. Now they're pumping even more Facebook ads and now they have to get, they've got 40 staff. You see these buyers agents advertising my team of 30, my team of 40. And I'm just thinking, all right, I mean, maybe you're paying them 100K a pop, whether that's commission or fixed. You know, they've got 30 people, that's 3 million bucks, all right? So now you've got to make at least 6 million bucks to make this worthwhile after all overheads. It's like, that's a lot of clients a month and I don't see that many good properties, <laughs> right? So a lot of this phenomenon behind the scenes is, uh, and the main person may be a super nice girl or or, uh, or guy, right? It's I'm not attacking them from a personal perspective, but this is the commerce or business capitalistic vortex that that sucks you in and, and ultimately it leads to negative outcomes for, for clients. So, I mean, I've made it a point. I've never advertised on Facebook, run a, never run a single ad on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, any social media. Um, it, a, because I don't need to, but B, because I know that that would, that would just mean that the business kind of implodes. There's just too much demand. And yeah, I just also become one of these buyers agents, right? So, um, I, I think those are all contributing factors. Now, is that something that is going to cause property markets, like let's say Armadale, like I referred to before in um, in Perth, where right now I think more than 50% of all transactions are East Coast investors. And I, I don't want to poo-poo Armadale, right? Like my clients have bought there as well, 2021, 2022. Totally. You know, they've made a lot of money. Good, good for them. I don't recommend they sell, you know. Um, but the question is, is this phenomenon of buyer's agents, is this phenomenon even outside of buyer's agents, how there's a shortage of housing, prices are rising, are people going to all of a sudden stop buying in Armadale? And is that going to cause a price fall, a, a price crash? Now, let's say for my clients who've already made, let's say, 90% gains right. in areas like this, even if it falls, 20%, like it's all good, right? I mean, 90% gains in three years are highly unusual in the best of times anyway. Yeah. But I I sort of feel for the folks who are buying in these areas now, yes. um, not only buying in these areas now, but buying subpar properties, main road or, you know, like 
there's granny flat potential, but there's a sewage lined under the backyard, which they didn't know about. Yeah. Or, you know, pick a hundred different criteria that, that aren't ideal. And I don't think these buyers agents are, are bad people, but I think they're just caught up in their own success where it's like now they have to churn through these clients to keep that machine ticking along, especially as you said, Bushy, at the start where, and this is unusual. I mean, I'm not as experienced as you and I'm not as wise uh, in, in, as you in, in your property experience, but um, right now there's, there's almost nothing for sale, right? Like, yeah. What was the number in, in Perth? Uh, less than 3,000 units and houses for sale. The equilibrium is well over 6,000. And I think just houses or detached dwellings is around 2,000. Yeah. And every month, 1,000 sales occur. So if yeah. there was no new listings, after two months, there'd be no properties for sale yeah. in detached housing for Perth. So yeah. you've got this environment where buyers agents need to get clients and they want to, and they can because social media makes it so easy. Yeah. People are fed the dream, you know, retire rich, retire early through property, blah, blah, blah. And you've got hardly any properties and let alone good properties. It's kind of like this perfect storm of like some, something's not right. You know? One of the sound, beautifully said, uh, I, I love the way you uh, uh, work through that because you, you've covered it off. And, and, and again, I'm, I agree with you. I, I'm not, I'm not having a go at individuals per se or buyers agents. There are some there are some very good buyers agents who genuinely are doing the right thing for the right reasons. But I think part of the biggest issue, there's a timing issue here with those conditions you've spoken about. But I think the the model of the industry for buyers agents is fundamentally flawed because it forces this type of activity. And and it's sadly, uh, the reason why I guess I'm I've become very strongly uh, talking about this subject is that I've now worked on behalf of our investors with a, a wide range of buyers agents and even those that start off well end up becoming like the others because of they have to feed their own machine and that, I think it's problematic the way the whole uh, setup is that there needs to be a revisit on this exercise. It, 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 let's take the US for example. Uh, where it's a very different model, where there's almost in in a lot of states, there's a buyer's agent and a selling agent on every transaction, and they share the commission. Uh, so uh, it, it's less uh, pressured for the buyer's agent to do that, uh, and it means then that there's a, a stronger quality rather than the quantity focus that emerges from that exercise. And you know, sadly. I've got to the point now where a lot of buyers agents won't work with us if 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 and if they know an investor's got Bushy Martin and the Know How team attached, they don't want to play. Uh, mm. And but by the way, we share the same view because when I see buyers agents that are giving a, an investor four hours to make a decision on a property, there's something seriously wrong in in the whole yeah. exercise. Uh, so so I think there, there's some structural issues around the exercise that's contributing most uh, to this exercise, there's always going to be good people who will still do the right thing. And, and there are. You know, we're, we're uh, currently working with a number of buyers agents who investors have engaged who are doing a fantastic job. And, and they're applying that. You know, that, the litmus test for me is always, uh, I only say yes to a property when I can't say no. Uh, so right. I'm, looking, I'm looking to say no. I'm looking to... to uh, are all of these different metrics and all of the, the key due diligence points being covered? Because if they're not, and it's a big enough issue, then that's a reason to walk away. Whereas because of the structural pressure on buyers agents, there's a invisible hand that's saying, we've got to say yes, because we, we need to get the coin and, and feed the machine. So yeah, uh, no, it's, it's, it's a hard nut to crack because like, let's say in the US, a lot of buyers agents say, well, you know, buyers agents are a good thing and, and everyone should be using buyers agent because everyone uses the buyers agent over in the US. But if you if you actually analyze the market in the US, what you have is the sale, the seller, the vendor actually pays the selling agent or the listing agent's fee and the buyers agent's fee. Yeah. All right. So there's actually it's a different model. Yeah. That, that would never fly <laughs> yeah. in Australia. And the listing agent does almost nothing 
the buyer's agent actually almost works for the listing agent to sell the property. For example, if you want to go buy, you know, see an open home, you actually contact a buying the buying agent, the buyer's agent, and they show you around the property. The, the listing agent's hardly even. The listing agent has almost no uh, marketing or advertising. They get their money from basically just securing the client who wants to sell. And then the buyer's agent effectively sells it on their behalf. So huge conflict of interest, right? And actually there was a, a class action lawsuit that happened in the US just a few months ago. And so this whole model is being revised. And and I in, in Australia, of course, buyer's agents will say we're different because the the buyer or the investor pays for our services. So so we're a little bit um, independent, but really the in you have to follow the money trail, you know, when it comes to incentivization. And so when do buyers agents get paid? They get paid when you buy a property. Some of them are, are on commission rates. So the more you pay, the more their commission is. So I'm not saying they're unscrupulous or their character is flawed, but you, at the end of the day, humans are humans, and you got to follow the money because the money is what really dictates the the incentive structure. So this is yeah, you know, this is one problem uh, with with the buyer's agent industry where I, I feel you know I, I feel that they're an extended arm of the sales agents. And if you talk to sales agents, which a lot of investors don't, these guys are having the time of their lives, right? <laughs> these guys are like, this is the best job. This is like I gotta do nothing. I put a an off off market um, tag on the property, even if it's on, online already, and it's going to go out the door. And the buyer's agent says to their client, "You got three hours to decide." And look, it's it's kind of disheartening because the new property investor or even the experienced property investor, they they know it's a hot market. They've been missing out on properties, so, and so at some point they succumb and they said, "I just want to enter into the market." Yeah, and here's the thing: buyers agents will say, "But look at our amazing reviews. You know, look, look at this property that we've just bought, and it's gone up fifty thousand dollars in value in the last three months, and so therefore they get the five star review on Google and and this and that, and that's great. But all of that." client happiness experience happens in the short term but what 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 about 3 years later when you actually found out yes the property went up in the short term but you know that was actually on a main road and you can't sell properties in a down market on a on a four lane main road very easily or you know you find that you know it's actually gone up in value but the valuer comes out 2 years later and says nah this is on a main road or you know says an easement here or Actually, this carport is this granny flat is not council approved. We're not going to give you that equity uplift that you wanted. But by that time, the buyer's agents got their good review. They're they're sailing into the horizon. Business is booming, and who's really going to go back two, three years later and be like, update their experience with the buyer's agent? Who's who's really going to talk about them on Facebook? Who's really going to talk about them publicly? So. And, and the circus goes on. So, I mean, this is not, I think there are 5% good bias agents. I think in any, any industry, yeah. there's sort of 80, 20 rule, right? 80% of people are probably not great or okay. 20% top in the bias agent industry, because there's really no qualifications apart from a four week course, right? Um, you don't need a degree, you don't need a diploma, you don't need any experience, you don't need an IQ test, you don't need you know anything like that. Like you said, I think there's some good ones, um, I think they're about five percent, and ninety-five yeah. percent. Um, either, how should I say this? They're trying to do the right thing, but they just don't know enough themselves. You know, like let's say this guy called PK does a video on YouTube in 2022 about how Perth's going to go up, and then they produce a whole bunch of content, get their clients in, in Perth, right? Um, or they genuinely don't care about the customer. But I don't think there's many buyers agents who genuinely don't care about the customer. I think there's a level of ignorance. Um, so you can't really blame them uh, to some extent. It's We can more blame the regulatory bodies yes. uh, for a, a lack of barriers to entry. 100%. And and, and the industry model needs some uh, to go. I don't have a solution right now, but there needs to be one uh, because very simply, you know, some of the things that... Uh, 
investors that need to be asking the question of if they if they need or are looking to engage a buyer's agent, how, how many properties does a buyer's agent actually own over what period? Uh, and can I just can I just interject very rudely, um, Bushi, mm-hmm. and and just add to that? How many properties did they get before they became a buyer's agent yes. with their seven figure income post buyer's agency? <laughs> that very is good the comment. That is the thing, because it's so sexy to say, and and, I mean, it's the case with me as well. There's there's no way I would be 14, 15 million portfolio debt free right now if I hadn't have had at least some course income. I mean, I was already six figure passive income before I started the course, but definitely not 15 million debt free, right? So you got to break it down and say, all right, um, guys, look, we have to be apples and apples here. I had this portfolio, 120k passive income, you know, back in 2017, 18, 19, before my course really took off. Um, this is, you know, I had nine, whatever it is. Since then, yes, I've grown. I've become quote unquote wealthier for whatever vanity metric that serves. But a lot, some of that is actually due to the course. Or in my case, actually, I did some development projects. So once again, you can't really expect to achieve what I've achieved unless you're happy to do development projects invest yeah. this and that you know it's i think people need to be transparent otherwise it's like that 30 properties by age 30 yeah i can do that too without knowing that guy makes five million dollars a year <laughs> right. it's spot on they're really good qualification and and also talking to uh existing clients some time ago anyone who's bought properties post COVID uh, from a buyer's agent uh, the buyer's agent is going to be able to brag about the growth uh, I'm not into anyone with a pulse could have done that. Uh, my always focus is let's look at the long term portfolio potential. And I'm, I'm not interested in what you're going to tell me, Mr. or Mrs. Buyer's Agent. I want to talk to some of your long term clients and, and have a conversation directly with them. So you're actually benchmarking what the, the, the truth, the good, bad, and ugly is. Uh, th- th- going beyond that, uh, how else do you think investors can better protect themselves and or take advantage of some of this? sort of herd hunting, market making behavior that we're saying. Yeah, look, I, I, just to tack on one point that just came to my mind in terms of talking with old clients, I think, you know, if you ask, uh, this is a wrong example because I know you're a stand up sort of guy, Bushy, but if I ask you, Bushy, hey, can you give me like three phone numbers of clients you've worked with for the last five years? Of course, anyone with half a brain is going to give like, the good ones, right? That you're mates with or right. whatever. So I think this is the power of social media. Don't don't ask PK, don't ask Bushy, don't ask the buyer's agent for their long-term clients. Go and find them yourself. And yes. you know, if they have a social media presence, like for example, in my Facebook community, there's 50,000 people. Go back to posts where I've you know mentioned client deals and tagged them from five years ago, six years ago, and yes. just DM them. You know, if you DM them enough people, some of people are going to reply, especially if if they're unhappy, right? <laughs> generally, people reply if they're super happy or unhappy. That's who leaves reviews. <laughs> so. Well, um, I think that that's just something that came. Sorry, sorry to to digress. How can people better protect themselves? Investors protect themselves against this phenomenon. Look, apart from saying the obvious, which is to educate yourself from various sources and and educate yourself deeply. I think people should always question everything. I think people, and I think people are guilty of it with me as well. They, you know, they kind of put you on a pedestal and say, oh, whatever that guy says or that girl says because they have a big following must be right. But I think we're in the, we live in the age of, of extreme and um, of, of, of heightened individualism. Uh, there's many downsides to that, uh, but one upside is that you don't have to believe what anyone else is telling you and you should question everything. So in, in for example, in my case, of course, I don't give properties to folks. I teach them how to find suburbs, streets, properties, and and then they validate that with me. But in the buyer's agent business model where someone is giving you a property, most of the time it's a rebranded core logic 10 page report which says buyer's agent name, but actually it was just it's the same as core logic. And it has, you know, nothing against core logic. It cool charts and pie charts and bar charts and all sorts of cool things, but it's like that the buyer's agent says, here's the link to the property and here's the research, the PDF, which they have just, you know, automatically generated. Um, let me know in four hours, right? And you're like, you download that PDF. And I know this, Bushy, and you know this. 
I know they have to me. And, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, how do I know if this suburb is good? This is just dark. This is just charts. I mean, what's the thresholds? What What's the story? What's the narrative? And same with the property. I mean, three bullet points in an email isn't going to cut it. You know, you can't just say it's a growth corridor. You can't just say population's rising. You can't just say there's a new hospital being planned. And I think this is the, the issue. Um, people they've paid the retainer to the buyer's agent and maybe the buyer's agent sent them like three properties and they've you know said no or missed out and now they start to feel pressure because there's a bit of pressure coming from the buyer's agent so he's got to get through clients right a big wait list and then you can't you know you can't really ask the questions and so then you just buy and it may be good it may not be good but i really encourage people you know don't leave your buyer's agent <laughs> funny that i should say that don't leave your buyer's agent i mean it, Presumably, you've done your due diligence. They're a good person, but at least, um, at least have the self confidence to pick up the phone and have a, a conversation, or at least have the self confidence to go back ten email threads, right, back and forth, ask your questions. It's like, okay, uh, I get it that it's a, a big piece of land. I get it that. You know, it might be ten percent or ten thousand dollars under comparable properties, but what makes you say that this is actually going to perform over the long term? Because Perth's gonna crack it at some point. You know, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, maybe not the following year. At some point, it's gonna correct, like every market does. Yeah. So, what's gonna make this property stand out? And please rationalize your answer based on evidence. And then all of a sudden, I think if more and more people start doing this, buyers agents will find, okay, a client doesn't equate to three hours of work for $15,000. Actually, it's going to take 20 hours of work, all right, for $15,000. All right, I got I to gotta cut back. I can't take this many clients. Uh, I got to actually provide a better service, all right? And I think that could change the industry slowly and uh, and surely, but this message that you're sharing with everyone, Bushy, I think this needs to get out more and more and more for enough people to back themselves and treat the buyer's agent as a peer as opposed to a, a magician. <laughs> Love it. Beautifully said. Uh, 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 while we're talking about that, uh, and again, I don't want to go into any uh, detail here, but it would probably be worth sharing if you're open to it, but the key indicators and combination of data metrics and, and trend changes that you focus on to help you read the property tea leaves in order to identify good locations uh, and, and good properties. Can you share just whet our appetite a little bit with that? Yeah, no, of course. I mean, at, at a, a LGA or, or um, you could say a, a suburb level, it's really important to assess both short-term and long-term factors. I think people know these by now, like, you know, things like days on market, like stock on market, inventory levels. I won't go into thresholds and everything like that right now. Yeah. Um, even things like building approvals, for example, yeah. it might be a, a, a booming area right now. I'll give you an example, actually, in uh, just north of Adelaide around Elizabeth. It's an area where famously, I said in the best there, publicly and also to my clients, lo and behold, Bushy, uh, you know, got my tail behind my, between my legs because that thing basically doubled in, in the last two and a half years. But here's the thing. I say, and my clients say, hey, PK, did you like, did you get that one wrong? Like, what was up with that? And I say, look, there's an area called um, Anglevale. And there's literally thousands of building approvals. Now, in the last few years, we've seen um, uh, builders go bust. We've seen construction costs skyrocket. They, they've started to hockey stick again in WA in South Australia after coming down, the rate of growth coming down a little bit. We've seen it really hard to get skilled labor to build these things. So if we were in a normal market, you know, this, this particular part of Adelaide wouldn't have gone up so much. Or, or much at all. And the real risk is that now there's about 80% of all transactions done by investors in some of these Elizabeth areas. Why? Because they're basically the cheapest capital city <laughs> areas that you can buy. 100%. And when these, 
right? And when when these areas, and, and I could be completely wrong. Let's have a discussion in two or three years about this. But when uh, you know when things don't go right for those investors, when let's say interest rates go up again or whatever, a lot of this was speculation. The prices could go right back down when things normalize. Uh, with building costs, with construction costs, these approvals and the thousands are going to come out. And so then you're going to have a whole new suburb or suburbs built. And then these areas are going to stagnate potentially for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So look, I'm completely wrong, right? You guys doubled your money. You can't argue with that. There's no doubting that. And for a flip, you know, I, I, I don't know how to flip properties based on capital growth by doubling them in two years. I can't do that predictably. Right. But for those who have, you know, all credit and kudos to them, but it was an incredibly high risk strategy. And I don't think it's repeatable in the long term. For those who hold, you might find that you underperform. But here's the thing, Bushy, and I think folks like me need to be humble. The, the, the underlying problem, like you said as well, is that we just don't have enough houses in Australia. And the demand. The demand story in, in Australia is really shallowed out. The only thing that's keeping this the ship alive is there's no houses for sale. And so you've got supply sh- you know, really shrunk. Uh, you've got demand since rate rises. You know, it has come down. It's not fallen off, but it has come down. And But the imbalance is still there. So you've got a lot of uneducated, poor property decisions in what you and I would call normal markets 10, 5, 15 years ago. Yeah, really disproportionately uh, doing well, and so it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's hard to argue with that. But then uh, we still have to ground ourselves in the fundamentals because property is a long term hold, ten, twenty, thirty year hold, at least the way that I Sorry. understand and have done it. So, um, and and so that that's how I look look at the world. I, I love the example you said, and, and I, I'm. You know, full disclosure, uh, I'm very jaundiced. I know Adelaide very well because I lived there for, uh, you know, the last 20 odd years uh, yeah. or longer, actually. And and what I think, uh, I, I love the way you describe the exercise around Elizabeth because as an Adelaidean, uh, there's a real stigma around that area. And what, what gets under, uh, what gets missed, I think, at times is yes, is, is there, there's a direct, demand supply equation but increasingly sentiment also has an impact and the almost almost needs to be yes we might have seen some short-term results because the 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 rising tide has has lifted what would otherwise be pretty average performing areas and properties Uh, so it's happened despite itself basically as a consequence of that but if we take that long-term view because the fundamentals aren't there and there is still a some pretty average perceptions of those areas locally, but people in Adelaide don't want to live there. They live there because they have to, not because they want to. Uh, and that that does have an influence on buyer activity at some point. Once all of the, the interstate activity starts to, to settle down and it's back to local market activity that's driving it, that's when it's going to get interesting, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think there's those mix of exercises that we need to have a look at at a point in time. But if we're looking at those fundamentals, a bad property in a bad location is a bad property in a bad location. It might do okay short term, but but long term, if we're 15 years plus, it's going to show us colours eventually. Right. And I have nothing against investing in low socioeconomic areas. No. Uh, I have properties myself in such areas sure. so long as they're gentrifying, so long as the long term story is positive and there's not a you know, glut of oversupply that could come about in the medium term. Uh, what worries me, Bushy, is that the, the three levels of government, as you and I both know, are woefully either um, incompetent or have no intention to, to solve this housing shortage. What, what worries me is that the next 10 years, the fundamentals won't matter and everything will go up and people will be listening to this conversation in five years and being like, uh, nah, Elizabeth still went up. <laughs> so this this is what I'm trying to get my head around because we're in very unique territory right. with so much money supply from all the um, you know quantitative easing still flowing around. It's not being absorbed. Record housing shortage still in existence. 
And uh, I mean, it's a terrific time to be an investor, but you know, give it maybe 10 years, 15 years, hopefully at some point the housing shortage uh, rectifies or mediates itself. At that point, there could be a lot of um, blood on the street. Uh, that point could be 15 years from now, 10 years from now, five years from now, who knows? I'm kind of a low risk guy, so I, I don't want to take any chances. I just want to buy uh, good fundamental assets that I know I'll get a tenant. I know that there's not going to be 20 other properties on the same street from other investors where tenants have optionality. Um, yeah. I, I don't want to be up at night. Spot on. Yeah, no, it's really well said. Uh, now, just leveraging off what you've just mentioned there, there's, there's, I'm, I'm seeing increasingly in their media a lot more talk about reception and, and recession and, and potential property market crashes. Uh, I'd love for you to share your read on economic and property conditions in the, the medium to long term. Uh, what are some of the risks that we're facing and what is this going to mean to people that are looking to invest in property? Okay, sure. Um, like I think one of the biggest risks is uh, our uh, foreign exchange or the strength of the Australian dollar versus the US dollar. Um, the US economy is, is is becoming quite weak and I'm not basing that based on you know recent stock market tumbles and, and things like that, but employment data, various other things um, have started to to shift, whereas just six months ago, things in the US was actually doing really, really well. Inflation has come down in, in the US in a, in a big way. It's almost around 3% now, uh, and the economy is coming down. So I think rate cuts are inevitable in the US. I think the, the Federal Reserve, they kind of are a little bit more uh, audacious in their predictions than at least the current Reserve Bank governor. Um, in Australia, so they've said in September they're going to cut it. They've said that before, and they didn't end up doing it. But I think it's it's really it's really close. In Australia, though, we are linked to the US and and the global economy, but we're also our local economy. And inflation here is not coming down as much as uh, international peers uh, just yet. It, it is coming down, um, but it it's not quite there yet. And I think the risk to property markets. Is if the uh, if the RBA cuts rates because they need to maintain some sort of you know healthy FX position to you know to buoy our importers um, in Australia and so if the US cuts we kind of need to cut there's a lot of political pressure as well to to cut at some point yeah whilst the 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 inflation kind of genie isn't quite put back in its lamp and that could mean in the short term property prices actually get another wind because I don't subscribe to this theory of interest rate rises, drop property prices and no. interest rate falls, Neither. booms. Like this, it's easy for folks like you and me to say, interest rate cuts coming guys, get on the train, you know, another boom. I, I don't think it quite works that way. No. Although there will be some tailwinds to property prices because let's face it, people have all of a sudden more borrowing capacity. So those on the margins, they'll get into the market. Yep. So I think the risk is that happens, rates get cut, property prices continue, now get a second wind a little bit, not a boon, but a, a little bit of a, a tra tailwind. But then the inflation genie kind of comes up again, whether that's because of some war and shipping bottlenecks, which have once again reared their ugly head uh, recently, or because the more property prices go up in Australia, of course, the rents go up, rents are a key contributor in terms of inflation. Um, baskets. So that could mean that now there's six months from now, 12 months from now, there's another maybe cycle of uh, yep. of inflation locally yep. because um, I think the Australian economy is much stronger than, than the US economy right now in terms of its momentum. Yep. And when that occurs, then that really takes the sentiment out of the market because now people have lost trust in the RBA, they've lost trust that uh, rate cycles are very long and discreet. They don't know what's going to happen. And at that point, there could be then a, a bit of a correction in property markets. But once again, under the, against the backdrop of a, of a huge housing shortage, like even right now, they've not met their 2024 targets. 
you, you still you, you still fail to see uh, how how prices could come down even in that scenario. So I, I know I'm kind of uh, painting a kind of a, a nuanced picture where where various things can mean rises and falls. It, it, it's it's tough even for for you and me, I, I suppose, to exactly predict what will happen. But overall, I think that it's best to try to contain property prices for the foreseeable future. I don't like it um, when being an investor as well. I don't. I, st- I don't like it when property prices go up double digits every year because it's bad for Australians. It's bad for our economy. It's bad for our productivity. Yeah. It's good for the government in terms of revenues and things like that. But it's it's bad for basically the social fabric of, of Australia. And we, we always have to remember, you know, forget if whether we're a, a good Samaritan and a good citizen or not, but just economically, for long-term prosperity, we need long-term sustainability. And property prices are a key linchpin to that sustainability and driving the middle class. I don't want to sound like a politician, but economies only do well when the middle class does well, right? And right now... You know, to your example with uh, with Elizabeth, people don't want to buy in Elizabeth to live, but they're kind of being forced to because they've been pushed out of other more desirable areas. So, yeah, I don't have a uh, uh, bushy property prices up, you know, twenty percent next five years or ten percent or down. But I think it's it's complex. Um, we're lucky. I, don't, I think this decade is going to be pretty low risk property investing, um, but I hope. I hope it doesn't boom too much. Yeah, I, I, again, a I, I really good read, and, and I would have almost been disappointed if you had to come out and told me some definites about this is exactly what's going to happen. Because every time I hear someone say that, I get very nervous. Because uh, you and I both know like, there's so many dynamics that are going to influence on the exercise at the global, national, and the local level that it's like trying to predict the weather. Uh, but that's why I keep reverting to what's not going to change. Let's focus on the fundamentals because we've got the Ukraine war happening. We've got China having a lot of challenges and, and there's a growing dependence of Australia on on China. If, if, if China has a cold, we're going to get a headache. Uh, there's no, no question about it. So there's so many uh, moving parts. Uh, we've got to try and weave our way through this. And that's where, for me, if you focus back on the lowest common denominators and the, and the fundamentals underpinning it, and you buy good quality properties, uh, and and for me that's not just investment grade. That's having owner occupied appeal because we want to be selling our properties down the track to an owner occupier, not to another investor. Uh, then we're at, at least giving ourselves the best insurance policy that we possibly can in that event. So uh, look, uh, uh, we've only just scratched the surface. I, I love talking to you, mate. It, it, it's so refreshing to be talking to someone who has a, a similar outlook on on life and property generally uh would love to do this uh again because uh, there's a lot of topics that i haven't touched on today that that i would love to but i'm going to jump into what i affectionately refer as the the bushfire uh, uh ambush round and ask you four quick questions that uh, uh give you the blindfold and cigarette and jump into those so the first of those pk is what superpower do you wish that you had and why the superpower that I wish that I had is, oh gosh, you put me on the spot here, Bushy. Um, <laughs> look, look, look. I think um, if if I the superpower that I wish I had was facilitating better communication. I think all of the world's problems, many of them, uh, are solvable, and they don't get solved because people don't communicate. In the Australian property context, we just got to get like. The three levels of government, property investors, people on the far left, different opinions in the same room, those who have influence and actually chalk out a solution. Because as you, you know, as you go up in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I feel we are talking about it, but I kind of care more about the longevity of Australia and uh, the property market rather than making like a quick buck these days. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, great share. Uh, if you could have copy with anyone, either alive or dead, who would you choose and why? I think I'd like to have a coffee with Donald Trump, um, not because of any political affiliation, but I just want to understand, like, does he actually believe the stuff that he says? Um, and if so, like, that's phenomenal. And if not, like, that's fantastic marketing. 
<laughs> yes, uh, I'm not even going to touch that subject. Uh, I've heard you referred to as the orange maniac, and uh, <laughs> it feels like a pretty apt description at times. But uh, next question, PK, if I gave you $50 million in cold hard cash right here, right now, what would you do with it and why? I do what I'm already doing uh, with, a, with a lot of, uh, very humbly, with, with a lot of what we have. Um, we support an orphanage that was started after the tsunamis in Sri Lanka um, about 20 years ago, or just over 20 years ago. So I would actually, um, I don't know why, I don't actually have the ability practically to start one, but financially I would start um, more orphanages around those areas. And I don't know the first thing about regulations, but at least I would fund them more. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, last question, if I... If you could wave a magic wand and change anything, what would you change about property investing? What would I change about property investing? I would change. In Australia, I think people are obsessed with property, probably more so than most parts of the world because it's so easy to make money, um, both as an investor but also as a business owner, um, regardless if you're good or not and if you have scruples or not. So I would make uh, everyone need to do a four-year degree um, uh, and at least some work experience before they could either sell a course or a mentorship service or become a buyer's agent or something like that. I would create some hurdles and uh, I think that would serve the Australian public. Beautifully said. Uh, last question, PK, if I ask you to get invested, what does that mean to you? I think it means to really work on your limiting beliefs. I think people have the financial wherewithal to achieve a, a really amazing lifestyle design, but a lot of it is not achieved because of self-sabotage. And that self-sabotage is mostly due to childhood traumas um, and things that they've experienced, not because of their fault necessarily um, in their life. So I think before uh, you can get invested. A lot of these people, um, including myself, uh, we need or needed a lot of uh, subconscious and uh, mindset healing. Um, so get invested means to get invested on your internal environment, to me, before you start creating wealth in your external environment. Well, I'm walking in, man, you're singing my tune there, PK. Yeah, as you know, I'm a big believer in the intersection of self-health and wealth being the key ingredients to true su sustainable success and in everything. So that's a, a, a great thought to leave us with. Uh, I really, I we'll make sure we've got all of the uh, contact details in the show notes for those that I know are going to be uh, really resonating with everything you've shared uh, so they can take advantage of both the, the volumes of free information that you share as well as the opportunity to jump on board with your accelerator uh, course. Uh, so uh, I really want to thank you for taking the time uh, to, to dive into that. Before we close, if anyone listening would like to discuss any of this further with other like-minded investors in a very safe, relaxed and no-pressure environment, feel free to join us on the Property Hub Collective Facebook group by clicking the link in the show notes. And for those that would like to confidentially delve a bit deeper into your specific property needs or challenges, book in me, with me for a personal solution sessions by clicking the link in the show notes. Uh, or going to knowhowproperty.com.au where we'll have the opportunity to have some complete, dedicated and undivided time to draw on my 40 years of property experience to help you solve your biggest property challenges for a full 60 minutes. And that uh, brings us to the end of a another great conversation and very insightful, uh, engaging discussion, PK. So thanks again for getting your best at it and uh, let's make sure we keep the conversation going. Thanks, Bushy. I don't do many interviews these days, but I always like chatting with you because I can be myself. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Thanks for tuning in to Get Invested on the Property Hub podcast channel, your home for property investment insights and inspiration. Make sure you subscribe to Property Hub for free. Get your weekly dose of Get Invested inspiration along with every episode of Realty Talk. Australia's top online property show for red hot property investing news and insights direct from industry leaders and influencers. And finally, I'll see you next time.